This is The Scarlet Ibis by James Horst. It was in the clove of seasons. Summer was dead, but autumn had not yet been born. That the ibis slit in the bleeding tree. The flower garden was stained with rotting brown magnolia petals, and iron weeds grew rank amid the purple follux. The five o'clock by the chimney still marked time, but the oriole nest in the elm was untinted and rocked back and forth like an empty cradle. The last graveyard flowers were blooming, and the smell drifted across the cotton field and through every room of our house, speaking softly in the names of our dead. It's strange that all this is still so clear to me, now that summer has long since fled and time has had its way. A grindstone stands where the bleeding tree stood, just outside the kitchen door, and now an oil sings in the elm. Its song seems to die up in the leaves. A silvery dust, the flower garden is prim, the house a gleaming white, and the pale fence across the yard stands straight and spruce. But sometimes, like right now, as I sit in the cool green draped parlor, the grindstone begins to torn, and time with all its changes is ground away, and I remember Doodle. Doodle was just about the craziest brother a boy ever had. Of course, he wasn't a crazy, crazy like old Miss Leedy. He was in love with President Wilson and wrote him a letter every day and was a nice, crazy like someone you meet in your dreams. He was born when I was six and was, from the outset, a disappointment. He seemed all head with a tiny body which was red and shriveled like an old man's. Everybody thought he was going to die. Everybody, except Aunt Nicey, who had delivered him. She said he would live because he was born in a cowl, and cowls were made from Jesus' nightgown. Daddy had Mr. Heath, the carpenter, build a little mahogany coffin for him. But he didn't die, and when he was three months old, Mama and Daddy decided they might as well name him. They named him William Armstrong, which was like try tying a big tail on a small kite. Such a name sounds good only on a tombstone. I thought myself pretty smart at many things, like holding my breath, running, jumping, or climbing the vines in Old Woman's Swamp, and I wanted more than anything else someone to race to Horsehead Landing, someone to box with, and someone to porch with in the top fork of the great pine behind the barn, where across the fields and swamps you could see the sea. I wanted a brother, but Mama, crying, told me that even if William Armstrong lived, he would never do these things with me. He might not, she sobbed, even be all there. He might as be as long as he lived, lie on the rubble sheet in the center of the bed, in front of the bedroom where the white marquise curtains billowed out in the afternoon sea breeze, wrestling like palmetto fronds. It was bad enough having an invalid brother, but having one who possibly was not all there was unbearable. So I began to make plans to kill him by smothering him with a pillow. Hevel, one afternoon, as I watched him, my head poked between the iron posts of the foot of the bed. He looked straight at me and grinned. I skipped through the rooms, down the echoing hall, shouting, Mama! He smiled! He's all there! He's all there! And he was. When he was two, if you laid him on his stomach, he began to try to move himself, straining terribly. The doctor said that with his weak heart, this strain would probably kill him. But it didn't. Trembling, he pushed himself up, turning first red, then a soft purple, and finally collapsed back onto the bed like an old, worn-out doll. I can still see Mama watching him, her hand pressed tight across her mouth, her eyes wide and unblinking. But he learned to crawl. It was his third winter, and we brought him out of the front bedroom, putting him on the rug before the fireplace. For the first time, he became one of us. As long as he lay all the time in bed, we called him William Armstrong. Even though it was foreman, it sounded as if we were falling to one of our ancestors. But with his creeping around on the deer's skin rug and beginning to talk, something had to be done about his name. It was I who renamed him. When he crawled, he crawled backwards, as if he were in reverse and couldn't change gears. If you called him, he turned around as if you were going in the other direction. They need back right up to you to be picked up. Crawling backward made him look like a doodle bug. So I began to call him Doodle, and in time, even Mama and Daddy thought it was a better name than William Armstrong. Only Aunt Nicey disagreed. 
She said, call babies that should be treated with special respect since they might turn out to be saints. Renaming my brother was perhaps the kindest thing I've ever do did for him because nobody expects much from someone called Doodle. Although Doodle learned to crawl, he showed no signs of walking, but he wasn't idle. He talked so much that we all quit listening to what he said. It was about this time that Daddy built him a go-kart and had to pull him around. At first, I would just paraded him up and down the piazza. But then he started crying to be taken out into the yard, and it ended up being... And it ended up by me, my having to lug him whenever I went. If I so much as picked up my cap, he'd start crying to go with me. And Mom would call from wherever she was, Take Doodle with you. He was a boarder in many ways. The doctor had said that he mustn't get too excited, too hot, too cold, or too tired. And that he mustn't always be treated gently. <laughs> a long list of don'ts went with him, all of which I ignored once we got out of the house. To discourage him coming with me, I'd run with him across the ends of the cotton row and careen him around corners on two wheels. Sometimes I accidentally torn him over, but he never told Mama. His skin was very sensitive, and he had to wear a big straw hat wherever he went. When the going got rough, and he had to cling to the sides of the go-kart, that slipped all the way down over his ears. He was a sight. Finally, I could see I was licked. Doodle was my brother. And he was going to cling to me forever, no matter what I did. So I dragged him across the burning cotton field to share with him the only beauty I know, Old Woman Swamp. I pulled the go-kart through the sawtooth fawn down into the green dimness where the palmet fronds whispered by the stream. I lifted him out and set him down on the soft rubber grass beside a tall pine. His eyes were round with wonder as he gazed about him, and his little hands began to stroke the rubber grass. Then he began to cry. For heaven's sake, what's the matter, I asked, annoyed. It's so pretty, he said. So pretty, pretty, pretty. After that day, Doodle and I often went down into Old Woman's Swamp. I could gather wild flowers, wild violets, honeysuckle, yellow jasmine, snake flowers, and water lilies. And with wild grass, we'd weave them into necklaces and crowns. We'd bedeck ourselves with our handiwork and loll about this beautiful beyond the touch of the everyday world. Then when the slanted rays of the sun burned orange in the tops of the pines, we drop our jewels into the stream and watch them float away toward the sea. There is within me, and with sadness I have watched it in others, a knot of cruelty borne by the stream of love, much as our, as our blood sometimes bears the seed of our destruction, and at times I was mean to doodle, one day I took him up to the barn loft and showed him his casket, telling him how we all had believed he would die. It was covered with a film of Paris green sprinkled to kill the rats, and screech owls had built a nest inside it. Doodle studied the mahogany box for a long time, and said, It's not mine. It is, I said, and before I help you down from the loft, you're going to have to touch it. I won't touch it, he said sullenly. Then I'll leave you here by yourself, I threatened. And I made as if I was going down. Doodle was frightened of being left. Don't go. D don't go. Leave me, brother. He cried. And he leaned toward the coffin. His hand trembling reached out. And when he touched the casket, he screamed. A screech owl flapped out of the box into our faces. Scaring us and covering us with the pair of screen. Doodle was paralyzed. So I put him on my shoulder and carried him down the ladder. And even when we were outside in the bright sunshine, he clung to me crying, Don't leave me! Don't leave me! When Doodle was five years old, I was embarrassed at having a brother of that age who couldn't walk, so I set out to teach him. We were down in Old Woman's Swamp and it was spring and the sick, sweet smell of bay flowers hung everywhere like a mournful song. I'm going to teach you to walk, Doodle, I said. He was sitting comfortably on the soft grass, leaning back against the pine. Why? he asked. I didn't expect such an answer, so I won't have to haul you around all the time. I can't walk, brother, he said. Who says so? I demanded. Mama, the doctor, everybody. Oh, you can walk, I said, and I took him by the arms and stood him up. He collapsed onto the grass like a half-empty flower sack, as if he had no bones in his little legs. 
Don't hurt me, brother, he warned. Shut up. I'm not going to hurt you. I'm going to teach you to walk. I heaved him up again, and again he collapsed. This time he did not lift his face up out of the rebel grass. I just can't do it. Let's make honeysuckle weeds. Oh, yes, you can, Doodle, I said. All you got to do is try. Now come on, and I hauled him up once more. It seemed so hopeless from the beginning that it's a miracle I didn't give up. But all of us must have something or someone to be proud of, and Doodle had become mine. I did not know then that pride is a wonderful, terrible thing. A seed that bears two vines, life and death. Every day that summer we went to the pine beside the stream of Old Woman Swamp, and I put him on his feet at least a hundred times each afternoon. Occasionally I too became disgorged because it didn't seem as if he was trying, and I would say, Doodle, don't you want to learn to walk? He nod his head and say, Well, if you don't keep trying, you'll never learn. Then I'll paint for him a picture of us as old men, white haired, him with a long white beard and me still pulling him around on the go-kart. This never failed to make him try again. Finally, one day, after many weeks of practicing, he stood alone for a few seconds. When he fell, I grabbed my arms and I hugged him, a laughter pealing through the swamp like a ringing bell. Now we knew it could be done. Hope no longer hid in the dark palmetto thicket, but porched like a cardinal in the lacy toothbrush tree, brilliantly visible. Yes, yes, I cried, and he cried it too. And the grass beneath us was soft, and the smell of the swamp was sweet. With success so imminent, we decided not to tell anyone until we could actually walk. Until he could actually walk. Each day, bearing rain, we sneaked in an old woman's swamp. By cotton picking time, Toodle was ready. Doodle was ready to show what he could do. He still wasn't able to walk far, but we could wait no longer. Keeping a nice secret is very hard to do, like holding your breath. We chose to reveal all on October 8th, Doodle's sixth birthday. And for weeks ahead, we mooned around the house, promising everybody a most spectacular surprise. Aunt Nicey said that after so much talk, if we produced anything less tremendous than the resurrection, she was going to be disappointed. At breakfast on our chosen day, when Mama, Daddy, and Aunt Nicey were in the dining room, I brought Doodle to the door in the go-kart, just as usual, and had them torn the backs, making them cross their hearts and hope to die if they peeked. I helped Doodle up. When he was standing alone, I let them look. There wasn't a sound, as Doodle walked slowly across the room and sat down at his place at the table. The mama began to cry. I ran over to him, hugging him and kissing him. Daddy hugged him too, so I went to Aunt Nicey, who was thanks praying in the doorway and began to waltz all around. We danced together quite well until she came down on my big toe with her broggins, holding me so badly I thought I was crippled for life. Doodle told me them that it was I who had taught him to walk, so everyone wanted to hug me, and I began to cry. What are you crying for? asked Daddy, but I couldn't answer. They did not know that I did it for myself, that pride, whose slave I was, spoke to me louder than all their voices and that Doodle walked only because I was ashamed of having a crippled brother. Within a few months, Doodle had learned to walk well, and his go-kart was put up in the barn loft. It's still there, beside his little mahogany coffin. Now when we roamed off together, resting often, we never turned back until our destination had been reached, and to help pass the time, we took up lying. From the beginning, Doodle was a terrible liar, and he got me in the habit. Had they didn't want to stop to listen... To us, we would have been sent off to Dick's Hill. My lies were scary, involved, and usually pointless. But Doodles were twice as crazy. People in his stories all had wings and flew wherever they wanted to go. His favorite lie was about a boy named Peter who had a pet peacock with a ten-foot tail. Peter wore a golden robe that glittered so brightly that when he walked through the sunflowers, they turned away from the sun to face him. When Peter was ready to go to sleep, the peacock spread his magnificent tail, enfolding the boy gently like a closing go-to-sleep flower, burying him in the gloriously iridescent wrestling vortex. Yes, I must admit it, Noodle could beat me lying. Doodle and I spent lots of time thinking about our future. 
We decided that Windwell Grown would live in Old Woman's Swamp and pick dog tongue for a living. Beside the stream, he planned we'd build us a house of whispering leaves and the swamp boards would be our chickens. All day long, when we weren't gathering dog tongue, we'd swing through the cypresses on the rope vines, and if it rained, we'll huddle beneath an umbrella tree and play stick frog. Mama and Daddy could come and live with us if they wanted to. He even came up with the idea that you can marry Mama and I could marry Daddy. Of course, I was old enough to know this wouldn't work. But the picture he painted was so beautiful and serene that all I could do was whisper, yes, yes. Once I had succeeded in teaching Doodle to walk, I began to believe in my own infallibility. I prepared a terrific development program for him, unknown to Mama and Daddy, of course. I would teach him to run, to swim, to climb trees, and to fight. He, too, now believed in my infallibility, and we set the deadline for these accomplishments less than a year away when it had been decided Doodle would start to school. That winter we didn't make much progress, for I was in school, and Doodle suffered from one bad cold after another. But when spring came, rich and warm, we raised our sights again. Success lay at the end of the summer like a pot of gold, and our campaign got off to a good start. On hot days, Doodle and I went down to the horse head landing, and I gave him swimming lessons or showed him how to row a boat. Sometimes we descended to the cool greenness of Old Woman's Swamp and climbed the rope vines or box scientifically beneath the pine where we had learned to walk. Promise hung about us like the leaves, and wherever we looked, fawns unfueled and boards broke into song. That summer, the summer of 1918, was blighted. In May and June, there was no rain, and the crops withered, curled up, then died under the thirsty sun. One morning in July, a hurricane came out of the east, tipping over the oaks in the yard and splitting the limbs of the elm trees. That afternoon, it roared back out of the rest, blew the fallen oaks around, snapping their roots and tearing them out of the earth like a hawk at the entrails of a chicken. Cotton balls were wrenched from the stalks and lay like green walnuts in the valleys between the rows, while the cornfield leaned over unformally so that the tassels touched the ground. Doodle and, I Doodle and I followed Daddy out to the cottonfield, where he stood, shoulders sagging, surveying the ru ruin. When his chin sank down into his chest, we were frightened, and Doodle slipped his hand into mine. Suddenly, Daddy straightened his shoulders, raised a giant, knuckly fist, and with a voice that seemed to rumble out of the earth itself began coursing heaven, hell, the weather, and the Republican Party. Doodle and I, prodding each other and giggling, went back to the house, knowing that everything would be all right. And during that summer, strange names were hoard through the house. Chatia, Theory, Amiens, Sorsons, and whole blessing of the supper table. Mama once said, and plus the Pearsons, whose boy Joe was lost at Bellow Wood. So we came to that clove of seasons. School was only a few weeks away, and Doodle was far behind schedule. He could barely clear the ground when climbing up the rope vines, and his swimming was certainly not passable. We decided to double our efforts to make that last drive and reach our pot of gold. I made him swim until he turned blue and row until he couldn't lift an oar. Wherever we went, I purposely walked fast, and although he kept up, his face turned red and his eyes became glazed. Once, he could go no farther, so he collapsed on the ground and began to cry. Oh, come on, Doodle, I urged. You can do it. Do you want to be different from everybody else when you start school? Does it make any difference? It certainly does, I said. Now come on. And I helped him up. As we slipped through the dog days, Doodle began to look feverish. And Mama felt his forehead, asking him if he felt ill. At night, he didn't sleep well. And sometimes he had nightmares. Crying out until I touched him and said, Wake up, Doodle. Wake up. It was Saturday noon, just a few days before school was to start. I should have already admitted defeat, but my pride wouldn't let me. The excitement of our program had now been gone for weeks, but still we kept on with a tired dog dodgeness. It was too late to turn back, for we had both wandered too far into a new to an into a net of expectations, and left no crumbs behind. Daddy, Mama, Doodle, and I were seated at the dining room table having lunch. It was a hot day, with all the windows and doors open and 
case a breeze should come. In the kitchen, Aunt Nice was humming softly. After a long silence, Sally spoke. It's so calm. I won't be surprised if I had a storm this afternoon. I haven't heard of rain frogs, said Mama, who believed in signs, as she solved the bread around the table. I did, declare, declare Doodle, down in the swamp. He didn't, I said contrarily. You did, eh, said Daddy, ignoring my denial. I certainly did, Doodle reiterated, scowling at me over or at the top of his iced tea glass, and we were quiet again. Suddenly, from out in the yard, came a strange, croaking noise. Doodle stopped eating, with a piece of bread poised ready for his mouth. His eyes popped round like two blue buttons. What's that? he whispered. I jumped up, knocking over my chair and had reached the door when Mama called. Pick up the chair, sit down again, and say excuse me. By the time I had done this, Doodle excused himself, and it slipped out into the yard. He was looking up into the bleeding tree. It's a great big red board, he called. The board croaked loudly again, and Mom and Daddy came out into the yard. We shaded our eyes with our hands against the hazy glare of the sun and peeled up through the steel leaves. On the topmost branch, a board the size of a chicken, with scarlet feathers and long legs, were perched precariously. Its wings hung down loosely, and as we watched, our feather dropped away and floated slowly down to the green leaves. It's not even frightening of us, Mama said. It looks tired. Daddy admitted, or maybe sick. Doodle's hands were clasped at his throat, and I've never seen him stand so still so long. What is it? he asked. Daddy shook his head. I don't know. Maybe it's... At that moment, the board began to flutter, but the wings were uncoordinated, and amid much flapping and a spray of flying feathers, it tumbled down, bumping through the limbs of the bleeding tree, and landing at our feet with a thud. Its long, graceful neck chalked twice into an S, then strained out, and the board was still. A white veil came over its eyes, and the long, white beak unhinged. Its legs were cross, and its claw-like feet were delicately curved at rest. Even death did not mirror its grace, for it lay on the earth like a broken vase of red flowers, and we stood around it awed by its exotic beauty. It's dead, Mama said. What is it? Doodle repeated. Go bring me the board book, said Daddy. I went into the house and brought back the board book. As we watched, Daddy thumbed through its pages. The scarlet ibis, he said, pointing to a picture. It lives in the tropics, South America to Florida. A storm must have brought it here. Sadly, we all looked back at the board. A scarlet ibis. How many miles it had traveled to die like this, and all yard beneath the bleeding tree. Let's finish lunch, Mama said, nudging us back toward the dining room. I'm not hungry, said Doodle, and he knelt down beside the ibis. We've got peach cobbler for dessert, Mama hinted from the doorway. Doodle remained kneeling. I'm going to bury him. Don't you dare touch him, Mama warned. There's no telling what disease he might have. All right, said Doodle. I won't. Daddy, Mama, and I went back to the dining room table. We watched Doodle through the open door, took out a piece of string from his pocket, and without touching the ibis, looped one end around its neck. Slowly, while singing softly, shall we gather at the ripple. He carried the board around to the front yard and dug a hole in the flower garden next to the petunia bed. They were watching him through the front window, but he didn't know it. His awkwardness at digging the hole with a shovel whose handle was twice as long as he was made a slap, and we covered our mouths with our hands so we wouldn't hear. When Doodle came to the dining room, he found us seriously eating our cobble. He was pale and lingered just inside the screen door. Did you see the scarlet ibis buried? asked Daddy. Doodle didn't speak, but nodded his head. Go wash your hands, and you can have some peach cobbler, said Mama. I'm not hungry, he said. Dead board is as bad luck, said Aunt Nicey, poking ahead from the kitchen door. Especially red dead boards. As soon as I'd finished eating, Doodle and I hoed off to horse head landing. Time was short, and Doodle still had a long way to go if he was going to keep up with the other boys when he started school. The sun, gl 
gilded with the yellow cast of autumn, still borne fiercely, but the dark green woods through which we passed were shady and cool. When we reached the landing, Doodle said he was too tired to swim, so we got into a skiff and floated down the creek from the, with the tide. Far off in the marsh, a whale was scolding, and over on the beach, locusts were singing in the mortal trees. Doodle did not speak, and kept his head torn away, letting one hand trail limply in the water. After he had drifted a long way, I put the oars in place and made Doodle row back against the tide. Black clouds began to gather in the southwest, and he kept watching them, trying to pull the oars a little faster. When we reached Horsehead Landing, a light lightning was playing across half the sky, and thunder roared out, hiding even the sound of the sea. The sun disappeared, and darkness ascended, almost like night. Flocks of marsh crows flew by, heading inland to the roosting trees, and two egrets, squawking, arose from the oyster rock shallows and careened away. Doodle was both tired and frightened, and when he stepped from the skiff, he collapsed into the mud, sending a mod of fiddle, fiddler crabs wrestling off into the marsh grass. I helped him up, and as he wiped the mud off his trousers, he smiled at me ashamedly. He had failed, and we both knew it, so we started back home, racing the storm. We never spoke. What are the words that can sold or cracked pride? But I knew he was watching me, watching for a sign of mercy. The lightning was near now. And from fear, he walked so close behind me, he kept stepping on my heels. The faster I walked, the faster he walked. So I began to run. The rain was coming, warring through the pines. And then, like a bursting Roman candle, a gum tree ahead of us was shattered by a bolt of lightning. But the deafening peal of thunder had died, and in the moment before the rain arrived, our doodle, who had fallen behind, cried out, Brother! Brother! Don't leave me! Don't leave me! The knowledge of doodles and my plans had come to naught was bitter, and that streak of cruelty within me awakened. I ran as fast as I could, leaving him far behind with a wall of rain dividing us. The drops stung my face with nettles, and the wind flared the wet, glistening leaves of the boarding trees. Soon I could hear his voice no more. I had to run too far before I became tired, and the flood of childish spite left as well. I stopped and waited for Doodle. The sound of rain was everywhere, but the wind had died, and it fell straight down in parallel paths like ropes hanging from the sky. As I waited, I peered through the downpour, but no one came. Finally, I went back and found him, huddled beneath the red nightshade, bush beside the road. He was sitting on the ground, his face buried in his arms, which were resting on his drawn-up knees. Let's go, Doodle, I said. He didn't answer. So I placed my hand on his forehead and lifted his head. Limply, he fell backwards onto the earth. He had been bleeding from the mouth, and his neck and the front of his short were stained a brilliant red. Doodle! Doodle! I cried, shaking him. But there was no answer but the ropey rain. He lay very awkwardly, with his head thrown far back, making his vermilion neck appear usually long and slim, his little legs bent sharply at the knees, and never before seemed so fragile, so thin. I began to weep and the tear blurred vision in red before me looked very familiar. Doodle, I screamed above the poor, pounding storm and threw my body to the earth above his. For a long time, it seemed forever, I lay there crying, sheltering my fallen scarlet ibis from the heresy of rain.